Hello, my name is Clowns Adams. Where and when were you born? I was born July the 27th, 1918, in New Yorkshire, England. So how old are you right now? 100. Do you feel like you're 100? Yes. <laughs> Physically, what is it like to be 100? Physically? I don't know. I just feel it all right. What branch of the military were you in during your time in World War II? I was in the Royal Artillery. And what was your job in the Royal Artillery? I was trained as a as a signaler. The job of a signaler is radio, r radio and uh, telephone and the uh, semaphore, both light and flag. Where all did you see action in World War II? In France, 1940. What battles did you participate in there? The, the Battle of France. And ultimately, what happened to you? Well, ultimately, I was taken prisoner of war. For how long? Five years. All right, we just had to get that stuff for the record. So I'm just going to ask you a couple of general questions to get started, and then I'll just ask you to share your story, okay? Okay. So, uh, and I'll tell you when that point will be. So you mentioned you were born in Yorkshire. Did you grow up in Yorkshire? Yes. Talk to me about growing up in Yorkshire. What kind of things did you do for fun as a kid? I don't know. I didn't have very much fun. My father was a coal miner. And uh, we were very poor. How many brothers and sisters did you have? I had eight. Eight brothers and sisters, complete. What order were you? I was the youngest. Talk to me about the struggles that your family faced uh, during those depression years. Depressions? Well, a lack of money. The lack of everything. I mean, I mean, so tell me about some specific things you remember that really made you realize there was a depression going on. The thing I remember most was 1926. It was a coal miners strike. The coal miners in Yorkie went on strike for six months. And one of my earliest recollections is standing out in the street with a blue slip of paper for soup and a pink slip of paper for bread. Were there times that your family went without food? No, not completely, no. Do you remember any of the meals that your mother would somehow be able to put together? No, that I do not remember. Mostly bread and jelly. I remember every breakfast in the morning was bread and jelly. Before the war broke out, what were you planning on doing with your life? I, I, was, I was a carpenter by trade. I, I was an apprentice carpenter at the age of 15. And uh, that's all I can relate. I just, I would just be a carpenter. When you were growing up, and you and your buddies would get together when you were a teenager, I mean, do you remember any of the kind of mischief that you guys would get into? Mischief? Not really. No, I don't remember getting into any mischief. I know when I was. Uh, I belonged to a cycling club, and uh, that was my main interest as a, before the war was cycling. I cycled, cycled over most of Yorkshire, Derbyshire, and Lancashire. I spent most of my time on the bicycle as a teenager. 
Tell me more about your father's occupation as a coal miner. Did you ever go to the mines with him? I never went down a coal mine, no. But when when they worked overtime, I would go and take take food for him, and they would come up from the coal mine, take the food, then take it down. That's all I remember about the coal mines. I never went down a coal mine, no. What did he look like when he would come out of the coal mine? When he was black, absolutely black. I mean, did you do you remember the physical uh, toll that it took on him the working toll? in the coal mines? No, I did. Uh, they were all the same. All the coal miners, they suffer from all kinds of diseases, lung diseases. So, when you were growing up, uh, take me through, I mean, do you remember hearing about the tensions between the UK and Germany after Germany uh, expanded into Poland? After they expanded... No, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. No, that was when the war was declared. I'm saying before they expanded into Poland, do you remember hearing anything about the tensions between Germany and the UK? Oh, yes, absolutely. I read it in the newspapers. How did you end up in the service in the first place? I was drafted. How old were you? 20, 20 years old. I was the first, first militia. That was the first group to be drafted in the British Army for the Second World War. So take me through what happens after you're drafted. After I was drafted, I went to a place called Oswestry in Shropshire, trade, trading on the searchlights. I was on the, on the listening device on the searchlights. And how long did you do that? Well, war was declared on, on September the 3rd. They took the searchlights away, so we had nothing to trade on, so they brought in the infantry NCOs and gave us infantry training. And I remember going to Cardiff in Wales to guard a blue barrage during the IRA scare, when the Irish Republican Army was doing a lot of uh, sabotage in England. So the IRA was sabotaging England the same time Germany declared war? Yes. How did you hear about the declaration of war? I mean, do you remember what you were doing when you heard it? I was digging trenches in the, in the, uh, in the camp where we were. When the news came through that England had declared war. What was that like to hear that your country was now at war and you were in the service? Didn't feel very good. And tell me about the infantry training that you had received. Well, it was just infantry training. Bayonet training. All kinds of training. Yeah. Do you remember anything about the physical regimen? We did uh, we did training every day. That was mostly running, not not walking. We did about three miles a day running in the training. Now, when you were in Shropshire, were you already in the artillery? Yes. So when you were drafted, they just put you in the artillery, or did you choose that after you were drafted? Uh, they just put me in the artillery. And, and tell me about your memories of guarding the, uh, the barrage balloons. The barrage balloon was the barrage balloon was there too for the uh, to keep the uh, German aircraft higher, 
so they wouldn't come down and load the bomb. What did they look like? Oh, gigantic balloons, like airships, like small airships. So after this, uh, t after your time in Cardiff, what happens to you? Then, on, on February the 29th, 1940 was a leap year. I was in, I stationed in Dover, and we moved out of Dover, through London to Southampton, and the board ship and went to London in France on March the 3rd, 1940. With what purpose were you all going to France? To join the British Expeditionary Force, already in France. And so, once you arrived in France, take me through what happens. Well, we stayed, we stayed in, uh, in Cherbourg for one night, and then went by trade down to a place called Pondichet, which is just a few miles north of Saint Nazaire, on on the Bay of Biscay. And this was the Royal Artillery Base Camp. And then? And then I was sent out on a working party into Bigard in Brittany, cleaning shells, cleaning all the dirt off the shells, sandpapered and the rusted might have got on the shell, and then rubbing them down with linseed oil. How long would it take for you guys to clean the shell? Oh, maybe five minutes. And what material would you be using? Just, just uh, cloths and water. And then later we rub them down with the seed oil. And then where would you put the shells? We just put them in a, stack them up in a pile. But wouldn't they get dirty again then? No, they were shipped out to the front. Okay. So, when you got to France, there were already forces fighting the Germans. They weren't fighting. This was a phony war. This was a null in the war. They weren't doing any fighting. Well, this was what they, what the, that time, the Americans called it the phony war. The Germans called it the, the I forget what the Germans call it. Uh, I forget the name the Germans call it. But there, there were no actual fighting. So what was going on? They were just, just watching one another. The war didn't start until May the 10th. It was May the 10th when the Germans broke through Belgium and Holland. So there was very little fighting before that time. I was in the artillery base. Okay. In uh, in uh, in Pondichet, and uh, then I was sent out on the working party in Brittany, hmm. and then back to Pondichet. I was in Pondichet a few days, then the whole base camp was moved up to uh, Forges le Zoo, which is between Amiens and Rouen. And on May the 10th, the Germans broke through Belgium and Holland, and I was sent up the line on the 15th. And uh, we were, it was con constantly air raids all the way up. And we arrived at Amiens on May the 10th. We arrived in Amiens, I'm sorry, we, made, we arrived at Amiens on May the 20th. And then the air raid started. And I got underneath a... a uh, 
a, a railway carriage and I got behind the wheel and when the air raid stopped, on the opposite side of the coast there was a young artillery officer and when he ran, I ran. And a few yards down the track there was a regimental sergeant major and he was buried up to his armpits, his arms were still out. And three officers digging, digging him out with rifle butts. And I stopped to ask if I could help, and they said, no, you go. Then further down the track, I heard somebody calling out for help. He was a grenadier guard, and he had his gas, the gas mask on his chest, and his pack on his back, and the axle of the coach just came down and crushed him, and blood spurting out of his body, out of his mouth. And I, I, uh, I got him out from underneath the, uh, from underneath the coach. And uh, then the guard, he said, it's no, it's no use you staying here. He says, leave me your water bottle. So I put my water bottle within his reach and I left him. And I, well, the only thing I could think of was get back to the base camp in Forges Lazo. So I started walking towards, towards Forges Lazo. And I came to the, uh, I came to the bridge, the railway bridge over the, over the river Sam. So I wasn't going to try to get over the bridge, over the river, not on the railway track. So I crossed over the river Sam with thousands and thousands, thousands and thousands of refugees crowding out of Amiens. And I just kept walking until I, I got back to Fort de Lazor, which was, took about five days, five days walking to get back to Fort de Lazor. And everybody had left, the, the place was absolutely vacant. So I, I took a new uniform, my uniform was covered with blood from the uh, dead, from the uh, wounded uh, Grenadier Guard. So I, I took a new uniform and then I just kept walking. And after a few days I came to a farmhouse and there were three French officers outside standing around a table looking at maps. And I, I asked them where the, where the British were and they just pointed towards Amiens, towards uh, Rouen. And one day I was coming to a, a bridge over a stream and two, two soldiers jumped out of the uh, bushes on either side of the, of the bridge. And they said, who holds there? So I was back with the British again. And they took me to a, a farmhouse <coughs> where there was quite a lot of British soldiers. They were all stragglers from different regiments. And I just stayed with them. Well, stay, <coughs> we stayed in the farmhouse for, for a few days. And then we moved to another farmhouse within within walking distance of the farmhouse we were in. And then one day, a sergeant major came running in. He was in his shirt sleeves, and he had his rifle in his hands. And he said that German tanks were going by on either side of us. So everybody got ready to move out. I, I, I was by myself, I was, so I asked the uh, commanding officer, I said, what, what should I do? He says, you go with that group over there. So I got, I walked out with, with the group. They were the Irish Fusiliers. And uh, we just 
kept going until he was getting nightfall. We came to a farmhouse. The farmhouse was already occupied by the Royal Engineers, so we moved into the outhouses. And I slept where the cows had been. And in the next morning, the next morning the, uh, the farmhouse was shelled, so they carried the wounded out into the orchard running alongside of the house. And they just laid them under, underneath the apple trees and they left them. Then we climbed over, a, a, we crossed, crossed the road, and climbed over a stone wall and a, across a cornfield towards the woods. About three quarters of the way over, a machine gun opened up somewhere. So we got down and we, we, we got down and crawled away into the woods. And the next morning, the Germans were just pouring down into France. We were looking out from the woods, we could see the Germans pouring down into, the, into France. So we split up into three groups, into small groups. There were seven men in my group. And it, it was my idea, my idea was to get to Paris because I thought that Paris would never fall. So uh, one day we were going to cross a road and we heard, we heard horses and singing and we had nowhere to hide, there was no bushes, no trees. All we could do was lie down in, in the ditch running along the side of the road and the whole troop of cavalry went by singing their heads off and they didn't see one of us. Germans? German cavalry, yeah. And then, and then one day we were walking along the side of a fence and uh, the lead, the lead man. He was he was hit and he was shot in the shoulder, probably by a sniper. And I don't know. There was he was shot. The bullet went clean through his shoulder. It didn't seem to be any blood. No blood at all. And then a Frenchman from the house on the other side of the fence. A Frenchman crawled out. And between us, we cut a hole in the fence, and we got through, and ran on the opposite side of the fence into the woods. And that night, it uh, rained, it rained so hard, we found our way into a barn, and up a ladder into the airloft. And the next morning, a French girl she brought us boiled eggs, toast, and coffee. And I, I hadn't finished eating. The, I hadn't finished eating the breakfast when I saw the uh, tip of a bandit coming up the ladder, followed by a German helmet and head. And the German said in perfect English, he said, "Hands up." So we were prisoners of war. They. Took us down the ladder, and we stood outside with our back to the wall for I don't know how long, maybe an hour. And then a German staff car drove up with uh, a sergeant driving. The young officers sat next to him. Then there were two officers sat with their backs to the driver. And in the back, on the back seat, were two high-ranking German officers. And they didn't say anything, they just looked at us. Then one of the officers, he had a, he had a heavy, he had a heavy baton in his hand. And he just waved the baton and, uh, and they drove away. So then they marched us to the, uh, the trucks, the, uh, 
the trucks they held they held twelve men and there were four trucks so there must have been more than fifty fifty soldiers that took us prisoner of war. Oh yeah, they, they took us to the town of Boucher and put us into a into a garage. And the Germans, the German cook sent us a big boil of stew meat down there with thick gravy, it was beautiful. It was the first time I really eaten any food for days and days. And then later in the day came the line of march. First came the French prisoners. Miles and miles and miles of French prisoners, and then came then came the British, the fifty first Highland Division, taken prisoner at Saint Valery, and the Germans they just pushed us into the into the line of march, and I on the third day. I don't know. I don't know what happened, but a German soldier, he came. He came up behind me, and he nicked me in the, on the left buttock with his bayonet. So the German medic, the German medic, he put me in one of every so far in the line of march. He was a, a troop carrier with a machine gun mounted. He put me onto one of those. Uh, one of those uh, troop carriers, and I rode for three days until we got to the town of Amiens. And in, in Amiens, they put us into a <coughs> into a soccer stadium, and the French they had a Red Cross tent set up, so I got the wound. Uh, I got the wound seated, uh, seen to and the bandage put up there. And then, this this was May the 22nd. And in the evening, the news came through that the French and Germans had, had signed the armistice and they just did stop fighting. So the next day, it was a, a, con, con, a complete new regiment of guards, so I, had, I was back on the march again. We marched through Arras, Armitiers, Lille, then over the, over the Belgian border and into Belgium. We stayed one night in in the, in the town of Ghent in Belgium, in, in, a, in a, a, prison that had been, a prison that had been evacuated, and we stayed there for one night. And then the next day we were back on the barge, and we marched to the Dutch border. And then they took us by train on on flat cars, stand, standing up like matchsticks, and down to the uh, down to the Zyder Z. And uh, then they they gave us a loaf of French bread. It was green mouldy bread. And then we they put us on a barge, and we sailed up the up the Mars Canal. And then into the Lower Rhine, and then all the way up to Vesel. And we got out. We got off the train. We got off the barge in Vesel. We were on the right bank. And there they took us to a, a camp. And we stayed there for a few days. And then they put us on, on trains on the uh, on the uh, trains they were box cars 
the, they were French boxcars. They they carried forty men or eight horses, and we and we we went by train from there on. And we stopped outside of Hanover in in Germany for an air raid. And uh, we got out of the train and stood alongside of the trucks until the air raid was over. We 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 saw the searchlights in the sky, but we did not see any planes. And then we kept going by train all the way to the village of Lambsdorff in Silesia. And there we got off the train and we marched about five miles and into Stalag 8B. How, how, how long do you want me to go with this? And I was stayed in 8B for maybe for maybe two weeks, maybe one week, two weeks, I forget the length of time. And then I, they sent me out on a working party into a, a village of Ratibo Arrow. And uh, this was, this, the project was irrigation. This was a, a working party on an irrigation project. And uh, being a carpenter by trade, they gave me the job of putting all the, the tools, all the handles into the tools, into the shovels and <coughs> into the rakes and everything else, the picks and shovels and everything else. So I, I never did go into the water. The, the idea is to pull all the weeds and growth out of the stream, you know, for the irrigation system. But I never did go into the water. And then when that was done, they they left me on the farm where we were billeted to to help the farmer uh, to repair his uh, wagons. There was uh, either horse drawn or oxen drawn. And uh, so I, I never did go into the water. And uh, on, uh, on June, June the 22nd, we were t taken outside and uh, on for roll call, and we were split split up into two groups, twenty five men in each group. One one group was to go to the coal mines, and the other was to go into the the aerodrome uh, in uh, in Breslau. And I was I was in the group for the coal mines, but the the uh, the director of the of the irrigation group, he said it would it, it would be a waste of it would be a waste to, to send this man to work in the coal mines, so they pulled me out and put me into the other group <coughs> for the for the aerodrome in Breslau. So, I worked for a few days. The job in Breslau, we were building a camouflage airport about two miles from the main airport. We were building a camouflage airport. All we did, we were the the prisoners we were just carried the labor just carried the lumber for the uh, two uh, two uh, companies of German engineers. One of the group engineer group 
was from Austria, and the other one was from Saxony. And we found that the, the group from Saxony was much better than the group from Austria. The Austrians, they had to prove themselves to be better Germans than the Germans themselves, so they, they were tougher. And then, then the engineer that was the, uh, over the, the building, the, uh, the camouflage airport, he pulled me out of line and he put me into a, a shed and he told me to build two boxes. And he, he made a rough drawing for these toolboxes. And uh, on the first day, I made two toolboxes. And that's what I did every day. I made two toolboxes. Although I could have I could have made six or seven of them, you know, if I had worked hard enough. If I had did. Uh, if I had, uh, you know, uh, anyway, that's what that's what I did. I just made these two toolboxes per day, and he he seemed happy every morning. He came, he came, uh, he came into he came to work in his uniform. He was a high-ranked uh, officer in the SA. That that was the what we call the brown shirts. And every day he come in and he just came in to look at me and talk to me. And he, then he gave me two cigarettes. Every day he gave me two cigarettes. Although I never smoked a cigarette in my life. And uh, we, I worked, we worked there for I don't know how long, maybe two months or so. Then the, evidently the, the uh, Kamafarge Airport was completed. So they sent us back to Stalag. And I was in, in Stalag then for maybe two weeks. I, I forget time. Then I, I was sent out on another working party into a, working in a glass factory. In, in the town of Waldenburg. And being a carpenter, they, they put me working in a, in a carpenter's shop. And what, they, what the, the job they gave me was repairing wooden shoes. The, the workers in the factory wear wooden shoes for safety purposes. If the glass fell on the feet, it would uh, break the wooden shoe, but it wouldn't it wouldn't cut the foot. So uh, that's what I did. Uh, and then one day he uh, they brought a, a man here, and he was a, he was a, a Luxembourger, and they gave they gave him my job. So they they put me to work with a. Uh, with a, a carpenter, and our job was building air out, uh, blackout. What do you call them, Colleen? Blackout to curtains. Pan? Curtains. No, not curtains. The purpose was it to. to to black out all the windows in the factory, and uh, and uh, we built all kinds of uh, blackouts, small ones, gigantic, big ones, and I that's what I did. That's what I did for the rest of the war. Then. In November, we became surrounded by the Russians. The Russians came, and we were surrounded with our backs to the mountains. So there was nothing coming into the area, nothing going out. 
So the factory was closed down and we just stayed in the factory from November all the way until the 13th of February. And they we moved us out over the mountains. The only way out was over the mountains, over the uh, Carpathian Mountains, and into into the German Sudetenland. And the 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 first night we stayed in a in a factory where the French workers had been working. And then the next night we stayed in in a church way on top of the mountain. And then the next day, going on the way down, we stayed in a in a in a barn. It was uh what do they call it, bounce? No sides on, just a roof. We just got down in the hay and dug down into the hay. And in the morning, we were, there was a fiddle air of snow on top of the hay. And then we, then we went down into the, went down into the town of Waldenburg. The shoes, the shoes I was wearing, they were, about two sizes too big for me. My feet were red raw. And uh, I just fell down in the snow. So the Germans took me into the town of Trautenau in the German Sudetenland. And there, here there was a, uh, a work party of South Africans. They were working in a clothing factory in the town of Troutnau. And uh, I don't know, all, all they spoke was African. They didn't, they wouldn't speak to us. Uh, so uh, I don't know if they could speak English or they couldn't speak English. And then they put the, we, they put us into trains. There were 20 men. They put it into a, into a, a on a, onto the, uh, onto the train, in, in a, in a truck. And we, they went all the way down. We stayed, stayed for three nights just outside the town of uh, town of Prague in Czechoslovakia and uh, and then we went we kept going by train all uh, into Germany to the town of Nuremberg and uh, there we, they, they they put us into a stalag in Nuremberg and the, the the air raids over Nuremberg was terrific. Seven, eight hundred planes a day came over Nuremberg. First the Americans by day and the British by night, constant bombing. And in the the prison camp was the uh, was the uh, Zeppelin felt. That's where the Germans they they held all the uh, all the Marches before the war, you know when the, the uh, Nuremberg rally. The Nuremberg rally, yeah. The Nuremberg rally. That was our that was our prisoner of war camp. There were all kinds of uh, men there. There were che there were Siberians. No, well, Siberians. They were Russians. Russians. Serbs, Italians, Italian prisoners, and the Italian prisoners—they were guarded by their own, by their own fascist troops. 
and the, and the, the British and the Americans. The British and the Americans, they were in the same camp together in, uh, in Nuremberg. And uh, we moved out of Nuremberg on April the 12th. This was the same date, same day that President Roosevelt died. And uh, we just kept marching day after day. And, uh, until we went cross over the river Danube at a, at a, uh, at a place called Noisloss. And then we were about five miles from the town of Moosburg when one of the, one of the, uh, we were in a barn and the, there was a pole working on the farm and he came in and he told us the American tanks were going by on the outer barn so we were liberated. Then later in the day American soldier came by and he took all the guards prisoner and marched them away. So we were by ourselves on our own. So later in the day we decided to to, to start marching again. So we, we marched into the town of Moosburg. And the next day we we tried to get into the, there was a stalag in in Moosburg, but the 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 gates were closed. They wouldn't let us in, and the, an American tank was outside. They just wouldn't let us in. But anyway, we were liberated, and uh, well, on our way in into Moosburg. We saw General Patton, he was, uh, he was in his jeep leaving Moosburg. And we were in the camp a few days. Then they took us out into a parking lot. They deloused us. And then they put us on trucks and took us into the town of Regensburg, onto the airport in Regensburg. And in, there they, they put us on the plane and we flew out of uh, Regensburg and we landed in Paris, France. This was the day before VE Day. So VE Day we were, we were in Paris. And then, in the, uh, in the late of the night, they got us out of bed and we marched to the, uh, to the railway station and they put us on trains and we went to Camp Lucky Strike, which was the, uh, that's where the Americans were leaving to go back home. And then the next day, we were split up with 29, 29, more, 29 men waiting for a plane to take us back to England, but the plane never came. So we went down onto the top of the uh, cliffs and looked over the uh, ramparts, what the Germans had built for the gun placements and everything. And then the day after that, we flew to England. And there, the, for me, the war was over. Tell me about the lack of information that you had during those five years about the world events of that time. And what was it like coming back into society and trying to catch up on those years? Oh, it was hard. What did you not know about, you know? Well, 
after after seeing all the air raids in Germany, I was surprised at how small the air raids had been in England. This, the, the air raids in, in England were minor to the air raids that was in Germany. Can you tell me more though about uh, finding out about the war? Like your daughter told me that you didn't even know about Pearl Harbor. That's correct, yes. Can you, can you tell me about that? Yes, I, 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 I never heard of Pearl Harbor until after the war, till I got back into England. I mean, how did you guys get your information when you were a prisoner of war? We, we had no information. No one had a, a makeshift radio or anything? Not, not, not in my camp, no. We had no information. The only information we had is if what we overheard from the Germans. And what would the Germans usually be talking about that you guys could pick up on? Well, it, actually, one of the men, one of the captains I worked with, he had a son that was in Stalingrad. And he was, he was surrounded in Stalingrad and, uh, you know, he didn't know what, was, what had happened to him. And he never did hear what had happened to him. And uh, all we had was just snatches of what happened in the war. We didn't, I did not hear about, uh, about Pearl Harbor. Four days later, we heard about that the Germans had declared war on America. And uh, We did not hear about D-Day, not for weeks later. Did you, when you don't know about the progress of the war, did you feel that you, the Allies, would win the war? Absolutely, yes. You never, never had any doubt? Never had any doubt, no. Especially when the United States came into the war. And for us, the war was over. We had won. How did you go about uh, learning about all of the things that you had missed in those five years when you came out of the prison camps? Uh, in what way? Like when you came back to England, how did you catch up on five years it's not like today where you could go on the internet and, and read about everything. How did you find out what had happened in five years? Well, only from general news, news on the radio, newspapers. Tell me about the difficulties that you had readjusting to civilian life. Well, uh, I, I, I was still in the army. Even after you got out of the camps? After I'd come, they, they, they re-equipped us. And they said that the war in Japan was still going on. We might even be sent out there. Yeah, well, and then, then of course, the, 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 the war ended with Japan. And we were just hanging around until we were discharged. Do you remember when you were discharged? I was discharged. I believe it was it was in it was I believe it was in May of nineteen forty six. So after you were discharged from the service, talk to me about your readjustment into civilian life. Oh, when I got out, I just went back to work as a, as a carpenter with the, with the same company that I had worked for before I left. Did you have... Uh, how much did you weigh before and after? 
you were a prisoner of war. I, I don't know how much I weighed before, but bef after I, I, I weighed less than 100 pounds when I came back. Did you have nightmares after the war? No, I never had any nightmares. What was that like, the feeling that you had been a prisoner of war? I mean, for that long of a period. What was it like? The change? I was surprised at the, how much the, the money had inflated. I was, when I, when I joined the army, I, I was getting seven shillings a week. That was my that was my pay in the British Army. When I when I got out, it was over two pounds, you know, maybe forty times difference. I mean, did you feel like those five years had been robbed from you? Oh, absolutely, yes. So I mean, that's what I'm trying to get at. Yes. Can you talk to me about that? Well, that was for me. It was a waste of time. I didn't. I did very little in the war. All I did was, was run away from the Germans. I, didn't, I really did nothing to win the war, really. I was on the losing side. I mean, what's that like, having that feeling? And not only having that feeling, but having spent five years of your life doing that, you know, being a prisoner. I mean, I'm not saying, I'm not saying you should be, but I know some of the American veterans who I've interviewed that were POWs, they said that they don't feel this way now, but they said right when they came home, they almost felt ashamed. That's right, We've, I was ashamed. I was ashamed of being at war. I, I tried not to talk about it. But what were you ashamed of? On the being on the losing side. Of being captured. Of being on the losing side. The Germans just walked over us. At what point did you start to open up? I don't think I ever opened up, even now. I still still feel that that sense that it was a waste of time and that I did nothing during the war. As a matter of fact, I, I worked for the Germans. I helped the Germans more than I helped the British. Is how you feel. That's how I feel. But would you say that there's been a People, a lot of veterans who are prisoners of war are now proud of their service and, and, and they wear that proudly, you know? Well, so do I. I wear it proudly now. So w when did that change come? Not until in the recent years. What do you think you would have done with those five years if you were not a prisoner? I would have been working as a carpenter, that's all I knew, that's all I ever did in my life. Well, Olive and I, we went to school together, same school. We knew one another in school. And we, were going, we went together all the time until we were married. We were married in, on December the 18th, 1939. How old were you? I was 21 when I was married. No, I was 20, I believe. No, I was 21. How old was she? 18. What was it about her that made her the one? Oh, we just, we were going together since the school days, since we were 15, since I was 15.
And so you were married before the war. Or wait, no, you were married after war was declared. Yes. I thought the war would be over by Christmas. I thought the the I, I did not I did not believe that the war would last so long. I believed that uh, the war would be over in no time whatsoever. This was before Actually, when I, when I was married, there wasn't a war. It was a phony war. Everything was quiet. There was no fighting, no, no air raids over England, no air raids over Germany. It was like peacetime. So you were married in December of 1939, and then do you remember the last time you saw her? Before you were sent overseas? Yeah, I saw her just before I left. They gave me two weeks leave before I left for France. I left for France on the, uh, on the 29th of February, so I saw her in February of 1940. What was that like, that leave? Well, I wasn't very happy when I knew that I was being sent overseas. I was very happy about it at all. And then when would be the next time you would see her after February of 1940? I saw her when I got back to England in 1945. Were you able to communicate with one another when you were a prisoner? Yeah, we wrote. We had, uh, we had uh, two letters a month and one card we, we could mail. What would you guys write about? Well, whatever there was to write about, was it? I'm sure the Germans would censor your mail? Absolutely, yes. Yes. Do you guys still have the letters? No, I have no letters. No. No, there's no letters. No. What's that like, being newly wed? And then not being able to see your wife for five years. I'm not very happy about it. I know that, but I'm saying, like, That's explain to me the uh, um, emotion. I mean, that was why I consider it a waste of time, you know. How did your family find out that you had been taken prisoner? My wife received a letter saying that I had that that I was missing in action and believed dead. Matter of fact, it's in the, uh, see one of those magazines, the newspaper clipping, when I was reported missing, believed dead. It was in the newspaper. The newspaper clipping is in one of those uh, albums. So she, she thought you were dead? Yeah, absolutely, I was dead for, for more than six months before she heard I was a, a, a prisoner of war. How did she find out that you were alive as a prisoner? She was informed by the, by the British government. Did you worry about that, that after you were taken prisoner, they might think that you're dead? Well, I didn't know. I didn't know. I didn't know that I had been reported dead. She, uh, I, she's passed away. Mm -hmm. Did she ever mention what it was like for her in those six months? Oh, absolutely, yeah. It was what, did, what, what was that like it for her? It was terrible for her. As it was for all. All, all women who, who uh, lost their husbands in the war. Tell me about your reunion with your wife when you came home. Where did you see her? Well, my, my, my mother lived in, uh, in Bradford, in Yorkshire. And uh, my wife was a wakeful, so my wife came over to Bradford. I went to Bradford first, because I didn't know where my wife was living at the time. But I had no news, no news where she was living or, you know, where she was. So I went home to where, where my mother was, in Bradford. That's, my wife came up to Bradford. 
What did she look like after five years? The same as what it was before. She hadn't changed very much. Not, not in my feelings, same. Did she say, did you change? I don't ever remember saying so. I was a lot thinner. Did you, did you ever regain your initial weight, or have you always been below? Oh, I, I, I'm a lot heavier now than I was when, I, when before the war. I, so... I never did weigh very much. I was only five foot three anyway. Uh, before we move on back to your time as a POW, can you tell me, you mentioned you went to visit your mother. What happened to your father? Well, my mother and father, they were separated at that time. Um, do you have any memories of the Blitz? I know. Of the Blitz in England? No. I never saw one bomb fall in England. And can you tell me about your time in Dover and the tunnels? What were you guys doing in Dover? In Dover? Well, as I say, I was training as a signaler in Dover. And uh, it's just like being a soldier. We, went, we uh, went to bed, got up and started to work at 8 o'clock. Then we finished about 4 and the rest of the day was ours. It was about... Dover Castle is about two miles out of the city of Dover. I walked out into the city whenever I felt like it. Can you explain the tunnel system? The tunnel system? Well, the tunnel system that I knew was uh, just going from one barrack to the other. They, they were... Why were there tunnels there? The tunnels were built during the Napoleonic War. You see, underneath, underneath the, the cliffs of Dover, there's a battery of guns. So not only was it a, a, an, an army depot, it was also a depot for the Navy. Those naval guns that was uh, in the cliffs of Dover. And what, what do these tunnels look like? They're just tunnels, around tunnels. See, brown, uh, and the, the Dover is built up of chalk. They were white. When you were a prisoner of war, can you give me an idea of what your diet would be? The food that you guys were given on an average day? We had, the average day was a litre of soup and one loaf of bread between six men. One, lo one, <coughs> one loaf of black bread between six men. That was, our, that was our date for the day. It was barely enough to keep us alive. How big is a liter? A liter of soup? Oh, what is a liter? Uh, how much is a liter, Colleen? Well, you just show me. Well, uh, I was thinking about a pint or something. Yes, I'm, well, no, eight ounces is a pint, so. I know, it's about a pint. Mm -hmm. A pint of soup. And what kind of soup would it be? Just mostly water. There's nothing in it. Maybe the best soup we had was a pea soup. Once a week we got pea soup. And that soup, pea soup was the best. But otherwise it was... Uh, just vegetables, no meat. Did you guys have any idea about what the Germans were doing to the Jews when you guys were prisoners? No. No, I never saw inside a concentration camp. All I knew was what I got from statues from what the Germans talked about. They talked about the concentration camps, but they didn't say whether they were Jews or what. I knew there were concentration camps in Germany, otherwise I did not know what happened to the Jews. No, I didn't know. 
how how are you all able to clean yourselves as POWs? Well, we didn't. This was one thing. All we had, well, in in the cell, like, we had to take a shower once a week. But on the working parties, there was no way of keeping clean. We were we were we were lousy, covered with lice. Oh, that is the biggest fear of the war, was the lice. Now, but in the glass factory, we had showers in the glass factory. That was that was clean. We had a, a we was built it in a uh, well. A, just pictures in the in the in that album there of the camp of the place. It was a we were built in, in a big dance hall of a or a meeting hall. Or it was used as a dance hall and meetings for the factory. And in this, it was it was air conditioned too. It was air conditioned with heat. And that was that was uh, that was all right. But in the other camps, it was it was terrible. So when you were at the work party, when you were a part of the work party and did not have access to showers, how long would you say you all went without bathing? It went about six months for the first time. Six months or more. And where would you stay when you're out at the work parties? Where are you sleeping? We slept in uh, in in in, uh, in Ratty Bohammer. We had uh, we were in a in a guest house on a, on a tavern, and we had one of the rooms in the tavern. Fifty men in one room. How big's the room? Yes. Not too much bigger than this place here. This little, little emerald. Maybe two of them together, maybe. No more. Less than that. What were, I mean, explain to me, I mean, I can almost guarantee that the whole, anyone who watches your interview, you know, in modern day society has no idea what it's like to be covered with lice. Oh, it's terrible. Oh, absolutely. What's the difference between head lice and body lice, sir? <laughs> body body lice is much bigger than head lice, and actually you can actually see the blood in the in the body of the of the lice that they've sucked out. They sucked out, yeah. What techniques would you all use to get rid of the, your lice? We tried to kill them, fingernails. How how else would you do it? No way, no other way. And you wouldn't be given any new clothes. You'd have to wear the same ones. Same ones day after day. You go to sleep in them. I mean, can you actually feel the lice on you? <laughs> Absolutely, you like can. Like biting you and everything. Yes. Oh yeah. That was a. That was a. When we got Red Cross parcels, that was the main thing in the Red Cross parcels. Was a bar of soap. We got a bar of soap. The first Red Cross part was I was taken prisoner of war. Well, I, I left Stalag. It would be some time, I don't know. I was, take, I was taken prisoner of war in June. Well, somewhere, I would say the end of July until March the following year. As we had, with that, that was it. We had no, there was only one spigot coming out of the wall for water, for 50 men. Well, actually it was 55 men. Five men went back sick to Stalag with ulcers from the lice. I mean, I mean, would there be hundreds of them on you? Lice? Thousands. Did, I mean, it's not like you can spend your your entire time just killing That's the That's right, you couldn't. So do you just let it be? Just let it be. Couldn't do anything else. As I say, five men went back to Salad sick with ulcers that was caused by the lice. From scratching. You scratch the lice until you got through the skin. 
and then that would that would fester. And five men went back to Salag. They were so sick, they went back to Salag. Now I I I wasn't working with the men. I was uh, by myself most of the time, so I, I did not get lice until until uh, later. I was much later before I before I started to fester with ulcers. But I I did get ulcers too from lice. When you were in the prisoner of war camps. Were any of the men, did any of the other, during your time in the various prisoner of war camps that you were in, were there times that some of the prisoners were killed? No. Do, do, whether it be escape attempts or anything like that? I never, but I knew any, nobody who ever tried to escape. From all the places you were all in? All the places I was in. Even, even on the marches, you know, when it was even possible to escape. I never knew anybody to even try. Did you ever think about it yourself? Uh, well, I thought about it, but it was safer to stay than it was to try to escape. Where would you go? Now, uh, when the after the after the uh, after the Allied troops started getting coming into Germany, then it, well, there was a chance, you know, but not much. Somebody would have shot you. I mean, if you escaped, you, were, you you had to walk, go into the war zone. A matter of fact, in the latter part of the war, the German soldiers were joining us because it was safer to be in on the marches than it was to be for them to be robbing around. What do you mean? Would they pretend to be a prisoner? Well, they were marching with us. Yes, they were safer. I guess so. I uh, never knew, I never knew of all the air raids there were, and all the air raids there was when we were on the marches, I never knew of a prisoner of war column being bombed. The Germans would, fl the, the Americans would fly over, see that I was in, in Bavaria, this was the American section, so all the planes that came over were American. They would fly over and they would wiggle their wings as they went over us. Your column? Yeah, they would fly, they would wiggle the wings over, yeah. Were there times that men died in the camps from diseases or dysentery? No, I never knew anybody to die. In any of the camps? In any of the camps, no, never. You're the first prisoner I've met to say that. Yeah. No. In I, any of the camps, none of them? No, I only ever saw one funeral in Stalagate B, and I saw a funeral going by, a British funeral with a with a flag over the, draped over the coffin, and he was being carried to the. You see, in, in Stalagate B there was a cemetery there, where the prisoners had been buried from the First World War. It, it had been a prisoner of war camp in the First World War, and there was a cemetery where the prisoners had died in the First World War. But I, know, I never knew anybody to die in the Second World War. I, they, went, they went sick. They were taken back to Stalag, but I never knew anybody to die. Can you tell me about your experiences with the diseases? What kind of diseases did you all face as prisoners of war? Well, dysentery was one. Typhus was the biggest one, caused by the lice. Tell me about your feeling about the German people at that time, the German soldiers and all that. The, 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 well, the guards that we had, they were mostly veterans of the First World War, and they they were quite understanding. I never knew. I never knew any guards that I could consider bad. Never. Because it, it is Stalag, the Germans, they were on the outside anyway. They went to, they did come into the camps with us. In, in the Stalag, there's a, 
the, the, the huts we were in, they held probably a thousand men. And there was only two guards in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the compound where we were. And those two guards, they were usually sergeant majors, but they did not, they did not carry any arms in any way, no, no revolver, no bayonet, no doubt. And uh, that's all there was. And uh, one thing of interest is, is uh, to go to the toilet at night time. We had to we had to wait by the door of the of the of the hut until a group of us, and then a searchlight would come around and pick you up, and the searchlight would take you to the toilet. And then when you finished. You had to stand outside again until the group formed, and the and the and the search line would take you back to the hut. In the in the camps that you were in, I know you said you didn't know of any escape attempts. No. But there weren't any tunnels being made underneath any of the barracks. No. No. Huh. No. I never heard of any. If, if they were, they were unknown to me. Uh, but you've got to remember that in the Salak, I was only in Salak for, I don't know, I had two weeks, less than a month complete of the five years I was prisoner of war. I was only in the Salak for, for less than two months, for less, maybe six weeks complete. So most of your time was not even in prisoner of war camps? It was not on working parties. And the majority of that was when you were making the toolboxes? Uh, um, yeah, most of it, no, not the toolboxes, most of it was, I was three and a half years in the glass factory. How many, is this the, the glass factory, how many other prisoners were working in there? There were 100, 150 in the glass factory. 150. That's with it. I mean, I mean, how big of a factory are we talking about? There were over three thousand people working in the glass factory. Who were the other people? All prisoners or German civilians? Germans and foreign workers. What do you remember about your interactions with the German civilians? They got along. We got along pretty good. I got. We got along pretty good with it. I had the German I worked with when I was building the uh, blackouts. He was more like a father to me. He was a veteran of the First World War, and he was more like a father to me. He was. He was good too. Was, Germans were good people. I have nothing to say about the Germans. Bad. Uh, the Nazis are different now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Nazis were different people. But I never had anything to do with the Nazis. I never saw any Nazis. The only Nazi I, I saw was the was the engineer when I was in uh, in um, uh, in Breslau working on the aerodrome. He was a high-ranking Nazi officer, but he was all right. He gave me two cigarettes a day. What did you do with those cigarettes? I gave them to the other fellows. I never smoked a cigarette in my life. Why? Why what? Why, why did you never pick up smoking when it was so common back then? Well, when I, when I was a teenager, I belonged to a cycling club, you know? And I, I, I did races in the other cycle. I did races and uh, time, time trials and all that stuff. And uh, we were told, I mean, I was... I don't think anybody smoked in the cycling club. We were all on smokers. It was it wasn't good for your health. Um, were there any acts of sabotage done in any of the work parties that you were associated with as a prisoner of war? No, no. I hid. We're in the glass factory. The glass factory is glass is only made up of sand, you know. Of what? Sand. The sound. It's just uh, sand and other stuff mixed with it, silicone or something, whatever it is, and they put it into the furnaces and they make glass out of it. And that's all it was. 
And I heard of some of the men saying they, if they got any any metal, they would throw it into the uh, in, in where they made the glass into the well, you know where they put the sand and everything. And uh, when when if you put a, put any metal in, then when the glass comes out, there's a big blur. It might cover a foot or square foot or so for a for a small bolt or something like that. I heard a man saying they did that, but that was the only sabotage that I ever knew. Would that make it completely unusable? For that, just for that section of glass, yeah. See, the glass came out over rollers. It was just come glass coming out from rollers, you know. And uh, when he got to the when he got to to the end of the rollers, where it was cool enough, there'd be men just cutting the glass up. Besides the blackout devices, what other uses would the glass have? The glass. It was. The, it was before the war. It was a spilled spilled glass factory. They made all kinds of glass. The 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 big sheets of glass was went for for the for the stores, you know, plate glass for the stores in the towns, and they also made uh, sights for the tanks. They cut them up into <coughs> into squares to put into the uh, sights for the tanks, and they also made windscreens for the airplanes. But where they made the windscreens, no prisoner of war was allowed in those sections. Geneva Conventions say that the, you, that the prisoners cannot work on any, anything direct with a, the with a war effort. You know? So, I mean, the glass that they made was for putting new glass in the storefronts and stuff like that. That wasn't, wasn't considered a war effort. The Black House, that we we never worked in the main office where the office was work. See, all we did was black house for the factory, and they were just made of mostly uh, cardboard. Oh, you're saying that the factory would have blackouts yes. during the air raid? Yeah, the blackouts for the for the factory. I thought for the, all the windows. I thought the glass you were making was a device that the Germans would use for when they would have blackouts. No, the glass in the factory was made for all common purposes, what they used for glass. I see. Windshields for planes they made there. They made the sights for the tanks. But we weren't allowed to work on that stuff because that was war, war material. I mean, I know that during your time as a prisoner, you know, you were at different work parties and you had a job, but how do you just pass your time? <laughs> time, it was 10 hours a day we worked. So then what do you do for the rest of and, your time? Uh, and uh, on the first place when we were in Ratibo Hammer, it was the, the, the uh, work party was about four miles from the camp. We had to walk there, four miles, and then four miles back. So by the time we got there, it was almost dark when you got back. And in the, in the winter time, it was dark. We went in the dark and came back in the dark. There wasn't anybody, you couldn't do anything. In the glass factory, of course, it was different. In the glass factory, by that time, the the Red Cross, you, you, well, you know, the Red Cross was doing most of the help for the prisoners. They sent musical instruments, for one thing. They sent all kinds of games, cards, and, you know, all kinds of games to play. What do you remember about the destruction done to the German towns and cities from the, the only, air raids? The only town I saw was Nuremberg. That's the only town that I I saw with any any real damage. I saw Pilsen too in Czechoslovakia, and that had been hit by. But there was nothing like Nuremberg. When when we got into Nuremberg, whichever whichever direction you looked, everywhere 
There was not one building that hadn't been damaged in some way, either destroyed complete or damaged in some way. Not one building. Anywhere you looked, all damaged. Were there still civilians living there? Absolutely they were. And the, the civilians, uh, I, it surprised me to see the civilians, their eyes were sticking out, you know, bulging out of their heads, living in the, you know, he was air raids almost all the time, day and night. So... That's the only town that I remember that I saw that had been any air raids at all. And I saw the people too. A lot of the... Can you tell me when you were a prisoner of war, when you were a prisoner of war, what would you fantasize about? <laughs> what what we would eat when we got back home? <laughs> Fish and chips. I mean, but is that I, some of the veterans have told me that that you know normal guys your age they fantasize about women, but all prisoners of war they fantasize about food. Absolutely, uh, food was mostly. Would you guys talk with one another about different foods or? Oh yes, surely. That's what we talked about. What? And, and the beer they drank? Well, what were you hoping to eat the most? As I say, fish and chips. Do you remember having your first fish and chips back home? Oh, absolutely. That almost the first night I got home. What, do you remember where you went? or? Well, when I, first, I landed in a, in a place called uh, Aylesbury in Buckinghamshire, that was in southern England. And I was there, I was there for probably two weeks before I went north, back home. This was in, in, the, in the glass factory okay. uh, in Valdenburg. By that time the war was probably, you know, three or four years old. You just put the pictures on the, uh, on the table. But of the pictures of whatever people, of the wives, whatever people had, or the girlfriends or whatever. And then they would just just pick out who they thought was the prettiest, and uh, and then they would just count them. So, you know, it was, I mean, it was nothing really. There were pictures on a table, and everybody went around and just picked out who they thought was the prettiest, or whatever they thought. They'd say that one, and it would be counted. And at the end, it was who got the most counts. Who got the most counts? In, in this one instance, was my wife. <laughs> that doesn't mean she would every time. Would it be the same pictures and someone would win a different time? Every that, that's right. That's the way it was. As you say, what was people? Do, what were we to do? All the, 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 what time we had. We had to make things up That's for things to do. Games to play. What life advice do you want to give to future generations? No more wars. <laughs> it's a waste of time. The Germans, you know, whatever, whatever they they told the propaganda, they saying that they, we were fighting not for the people of England but for the rich people of England. The industrialists. They were the ones who were making the money. It's proved to be right. But I'm saying, if you could talk to your great, 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 great grandkids, what, what, what do you want them to know? What is some general life advice you want to give to them? We don't have any more wars. That's the only advice I could give to anybody. Were you afraid of getting killed when you were overseas? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, when you were a prisoner... You... I, actually, when, when you say that, I never thought I would come back. I thought I would die some way. This is before you were a POW or no, even...? after. I could not see the end of the war, of, of surviving the end of the war. Yeah, I mean, after... after... After multiple years in a camp, I would agree, yeah. Yeah, could not see the end. 
And especially when you don't have any news of what is happening. Because you don't you, know the progress. You don't know the progress of the war. You don't know what's happening. All you know that you were taken prisoner of war, you were on the losing side. And you, and you saw you saw the German military, and you saw the way that Germans operated. The Germans are a very sophisticated people. Looking back at it, though, now that you know the timeline of events, when you noticed the German soldiers in the areas that you were throughout the years from 40 to 45, I mean, were they getting weaker and weaker as it got on towards 45? Do you, do you, looking back now, do you notice a difference or no? From the, I, never knew, I never knew any German soldiers, only the guards we had. You wouldn't see any troop movements or anything? Oh, we saw troop movements. I was, in, uh, I, w I was in Silesia, and that is the main route for the Russian front. I, well, I remember when, when uh, I remember the train after train after train going by with guns, you know, trucks, tanks and everything. And uh, we counted them, we figured that every six train was a Red Cross train, was a Red Cross train. So we knew something was happening. But as I say, we, uh, I never talked to any, uh, well, I won't say that. I, I, Germans that we knew, uh, you know, when, the, when we first worked in the glass factory, they, when they went and joined the army, and they had leave, they came back to, into the factory to visit. And they would, they would say hello to them, but uh, that was all. It's the only German soldiers I knew other than the guards. I mean, as a prisoner of war, do you always have uncertainty about your fate? Because oh, yeah. even if the Germans were going to lose the war, they could have they could have just killed you if they wanted to. <laughs> That's right. That's right. I mean, but do you feel that? And there was always always the fact that the latter end of the latter part of the war, that the when we were on the march, the last march we had, that the American troops were only a few miles behind us. You know, we got, sometimes we could hear machine guns. And then, you see, the first, when I was in, working in the glass factory, it was about November when we first heard the sounds of the Russian guns, the front and the Russian front. And it seemed to be every day they came a little bit closer until the time we moved out, the, German, the Russians were less than 30 kilometers away from us. That was the biggest fear. We had fear from the Russians more than the Germans. Why would you be afraid of the Russians? The Russian artillery. They, they don't pick you out whether you're prisoner or not. Were there times that artillery bombardments got close to you? Yeah, well, they're about the Russians were about thirty kilometers away when we moved out of out of uh, Wallenberg. What would you want to say to the men who were killed overseas in the war? What would you want them to know? What do you want them to know? How sorry I am. What else would they say? And that was, that's for everybody that died during the war, including the Germans. They were no different than the British or the Americans. They were fighting for the country. Um, My wife had a brother killed in the war too. Oh, tell me about him. He was killed in Nimwegen. He was a he was a a coal scream guard, and he was he was a, he was a tank driver, a sergeant. He was a tank driver, and he was killed in the in the Nimwegen area in the 1944. Was he your age? Well, he was about. Uh, let me see. He was probably, he could have been six, six or seven years older than me. 
But I mean, because you were dating your wife for such a long time, you knew him well. Oh, I knew him well, yes. What was his name? His name was, uh, well, his name was Jeffrey. Jeffrey? Or Ernest? Hmm? Ernest, wasn't it? Oh, that's right. Ernest Jeffrey. His name was yeah. Ernest Jeffrey. All right. His name was Ernest, first name. So just say his full name. What was his full name? Ernest Jeffrey Parkin. And what kind of person was Ernest Jeffrey Parkin? He was a grenadier guard. I'm saying what kind of person was he? Oh, he was a, well, he was like everybody else. Good guy. Tell him about the how he was a messenger for the king, and then he ended. Up yeah, well, he's a grand guard, and he was messenger for one of the princes, I believe, Prince Edward. Prince. Uh, I don't know. I always heard it was just the king. Wait. So what happened? He was a messenger for the king, or the or one of the princes. It was all right. He was a messenger for Buckingham Palace. And uh, that that meant that uh, if they if they had messages to send anywhere, he would take it by car. He, tell me more about his personality. I mean, tell me what made him unique. What was something unique about him? He was a big guy, six foot two. He was in the Grenadier Guards. No, Coldstream. No, oh, he was in the Coldstream Guards. I'm sorry. <clears throat> yeah. He was just, uh, just a regular guy. Did he have any children before he was killed? Any? Children? Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. Well, he had, uh, he had three, I believe. Two. I believe three children when he died, when he was killed. Yeah. What was that like for your wife? His brother? Well, this is way I, I don't know. Where I, well, we had a, uh, a there's a letter that uh, he wrote to my wife's sister just before he died. We have it in the back in the somewhere in there. Mm-hmm. Of course, as I say, I was a prisoner of war. I wasn't. I wasn't home at the time. So when you came home, you were okay. But then your wife told you that her brother had been killed. Oh, she it was got in one of her letters. She oh, she oh, so she wrote she wrote that to you. Yes, she wrote that to me. That Ernest had been killed. Yeah. This would have been your uncle. It was my uncle. But the 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 story we heard was from my mother, so it's probably different than what my dad was saying. But um, he asked to go to war. He didn't have to go because he was the messenger, and he got special permission to go. So I guess he was part of D-Day. I don't um, know if it was in D-Day. I don't remember. The, the D-Day, thing. they went up and then around up into the Holland area. But um, my mother always told the story about after he was killed, my grandmother was also very disturbed about it. And so they had called the doctor in, and the doctor advised them to take up smoking. Really? Yeah, to keep him busy. So my mother started smoking during the time. So when he married my mom, she didn't smoke. When he came back, she was a smoker. And uh, she smoked for quite a long time. I don't know how many packs a day she used to smoke. I don't remember. So that was a difference for her. But that's what they were told to do. Did she quit ever? She, yeah, when her dad died of cancer, she quit. She just cold turkey did. How? I don't know. But that's what they were advised to do. It's just like you had that friend that was a painter, Dad, remember? And the doctors told him to smoke so he wouldn't inhale the lead in the paint. Who's that? It was a friend of yours. I remember you telling me about it. He was a painter, you know, a house painter. And he smoked because it was supposed to protect him from lead. They had a lot of ideas about that was, that was George Wright in... Yeah. Yeah, you're right, yeah. 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 What kind of person... What kind of person do you want to be remembered as, Mr. Adams? What? What, what, 
What kind of person do you want to be remembered as? I'll tell you, as a person, I don't know. I came to the United States as a carpenter, and I started working for myself in Greenwich, Connecticut. And when I came to California, I took out a uh, contractor's license. I built, uh, I built 13 homes altogether. This was my 13th home that I built. That's what I remember as being a, a carpenter. I was a good dad, a good husband, and uh, good all the way around, I was hoping. Do you want to be remembered as a World War II veteran? Oh, absolutely, yes. Yeah. I did my bit. I, I did whatever. I didn't do much to the war. I didn't do much to help the uh, to help with the war. But uh, as a matter of fact, I was actually on the opposite side. But uh, I remember whatever I was. I I did my best as a soldier. I did what I was told. I went wherever I was told. And that's, that's about it, I guess. I think I was a good soldier.